the so-called best practices of podcasting. You'll read about them in Facebook groups. You'll hear about them on podcasts about podcasting. And these may make you feel kind of roped in, kind of like you looked at your creativity and said, hey, go sit in the corner and think about it. And they're like, I didn't do anything, man. Well, today we're going to hear from people who are breaking the so-called rules of podcasting. And we're going to find out why they're doing that. And more importantly, is it working? Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting since 2005. I am your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. You picked a good episode to jump in if you are new to the show. If you are new to the show, I help you plan, launch, grow, monetize. You need help with your podcast. I'm going to pick you up and point you in the right direction. My website is School of Podcasting. Dot com. Use the coupon code LISTENER when you sign up to save on either a yearly or monthly subscription. And, of course, that comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you get me in your pocket. Want to know what that means? Schoolofpodcasting.com slash LISTENER. And I got to tell you, I am so happy. Can you hear the smile on my face right now? I just downloaded all of the responses. Again, if you're new to the show, the last episode of the month features you answering the question. And I got kind of clever a couple months ago and I said, Hey, why, what answer, what question do you want to ask? And so we're going to get to that in a second. I usually start off with it because of my podcast story, but I want to start off with something that I just kind of go, ugh. and there's a thing like here in the U S we're not going to talk politics, but I just want to make the point that this happens all the time in politics. And that is some big company or a big politician will say something. It will be wrong. They'll go, Oh my bad. And then you go, okay, good. I'm so glad they changed that. And then they go, look over here. Kim Kardashian wore a red dress. And while you're, you're totally just like a magician looking at the, the beautiful assistant. Yeah. They go back and do it again. Here's a clip from the podcasting 2.0 show. And I wanted to let you know this because I now need to seriously consider if I'm going to continue to accept PayPal on my site. This is Adam Curry, you know, one of the guys that invented podcasting or helped invent podcasting. And of course, the pod sage, the one and only Dave Jones. Yeah, we did lose. Uh, we lost a twenty dollar monthly subscriber. So yeah, uh, people. Uh, you know, the, apparently PayPal just snuck their twenty five hundred dollar fine right back into their acceptable use policy and just. Did uh, they? Oh yeah, it's in there. Yep. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, no, no news at all. They just came right back, and no reporting on it, as you notice. <laughs> it's important to note. It's important to note uh, that the under the PayPal terms and conditions. You may not post, write, speak, fart negatively about PayPal. Otherwise, that is grounds for them to cut you off. <laughs> Just letting you know. I mean, that would be devastating to us. We don't, you know, that's like three months worth of donations. Well, it's not just that. If you read the language, if you support something that promotes dismisinformation, you know, terrorism, whatever else. You can get dinged as the financier. And you also get the 2500 hit. You get the $2,500 hit. It's not the recipient necessarily. If you are funding oh. that, yes. It's, I, it just stuns me that they did it and then apologized and said, oh, no, no, we didn't mean to. And then... Immediately right, went right back and did it again. Does it, does it, does it, that's, does it that's really, amazing. if, does it really surprise you? And so even though it was the pod father himself, Adam Curry, I went and fact checked and yeah, they, they snuck it right back in there. It's almost like they're, I don't know, politicians or something. Holy cow. So I just want to make you aware of that. Not sure what. I'm going to do with that exactly. My guess is I will, I have PayPal and Stripe. So I accept credit cards and PayPal at the school of podcasting. And I need to think about that because that could really get me into a lot of hot water in a way. And so here is what I've done is Patrick Keller from the big seance podcast. And again, 
Last time I swear I'm going to say this school of podcasting.com slash eight five one is where I have links to everybody. He gave uh, his reasons here and then he gave the answer. So I've cut up his answer and we're going to hear the question because it's a good question. A lot of people said, wow, that's a good question. And what I found interesting about this is what people define as best practices. Cause I'm like, really? Where did you hear that was a best practice? So what are we talking about? This. Take it away, Patrick. What standard or tradition in podcasting do you tend to ignore and why do you do it differently? Some very interesting answers are coming up. You guessed it right after this. So we're going to start off with how Patrick, for lack of a better phrase, colors outside the lines. How about that? I like that phrase. There are a few that tend to frustrate me because I don't always agree with them, at least for my podcast. And I'll give a few quick examples. Some people encourage podcast hosts to refer to their audience as listener or to at least avoid group speak. Well, when I listen to my favorite podcasts, I hate being called listener. It seems so odd. And really not very friendly. Plus, my listenership has always felt like a community to me. And I think they rather like being accepted as one of the community. I often refer to my listeners as y'all or (laughs) even paranerds, which is kind of our thing. And when I listen to a podcast, I want to feel like I belong. Another example, and I hope you still like me after this, Dave, But my intro and outro are very sacred to me, and they've been carefully crafted over the years to kind of set the mood, and they're longer with lots of dramatic music and effects. And many of my listeners have communicated that they love and appreciate it because it kind of puts them in an imaginary space like a candlelit Victorian parlor with a cup of tea just waiting for a seance. And though I choose to edit the intro and outro sometimes, they incorporate music for music's sake, which I know is a pet peeve for you. But I love them, and I tend to be fascinated by other creative podcast intros and outros as well. And actually, that's probably my favorite part of teaching the podcast unit to my middle school music production students. We have so much fun creating them. So anyway, all of that is my answer to the question I'm proposing. Thank you, Patrick. And there's a couple of answers that I've already heard. And I got to say, I am so excited and so happy. And I realize this sounds weird that people are openly disagreeing with me. I, to me, I can't, exp- well, I'm going to try to explain why that warms my heart. If you come up to me and say, hey, Dave, I know you hate long intros, and I know you you hate it when people say, uh, and I have a cl- uh, cure for the listener thing, I agree with that. Uh-uh. Uh, but the fact that you're openly like, hey, I know you like this, but I'm doing this, that means you don't feel afraid to like voice a different opinion, because you know me, I love to dialogue and go, Huh, I've never thought of it that way. So, number one, your long intro, you already answered your own question. My listeners, many of them, he said, say they love it. There you go. That's it. Answer solved right there. And the other one, I don't know if I'd ever say, dear listener. That sounds a little weird, but I will say you. Thank you so much for tuning in. That's how I talk to a singular person. And this kind of came up a few times. Let's uh, throw it over to Kim from The Pharmacist's Voice. This is Kim Newlove from the Pharmacist Voice podcast, which you can find at thepharmacistvoice.com. To answer the October 2022 question of the month, what I do is I ignore the listener avatar singular, and I have a listener avatar plural. What do I mean by that? (laughs) You're supposed to think of one person that you're talking to when you podcast. What I do is I have a group of people in mind when I podcast. I think that I am talking to pharmacists, voice actors, and podcast hosts, but among the pharmacist category, I think I'm talking to pharmacists, pharmacy students who will be pharmacists someday, pharmacy technicians, maybe some pharmacy professors, and, you know, a whole group of people. You get the idea. 
And when it comes to voice actors, I think I'm talking to voice actors who are in the medical space. Not everything. You know, we're not talking about commercials for banks here. I'm thinking about voice actors who are in the medical space, who do e-learning and medical narration. And when I think of podcasters, I think of pharmacist podcasters. I'm talking to them, too. So my group avatar works for me, and it's all about creating content that makes an impact. I get listener feedback from all those people, pharmacists, pharmacy students, pharmacy technicians, pharmacy professors, voice actors, even the ones that aren't in the medical space sometimes, and pharmacist podcasters. When I create my content, I think it's reaching the audience, and that's really important. That matters too. Even though it is not recommended that you speak to a listener avatar plural, that is what I do, and it works for me. Again, my name is Kim Newlove. I am a pharmacist by training. You probably gathered that. But I made a career transition to voice actor and podcast host. Among other things, I narrate audiobooks for women pharmacist authors. I provide medical narration to clients in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. And I narrate content for explainer videos and e-learning projects. I was inspired by my nonverbal son who has autism to combine my background as a pharmacist with my speaking voice and launch my business, The Pharmacist's Voice, in 2017. My son Craig helped me realize the power of having a voice and using it. My solo podcast episodes are about some aspect of being a pharmacist, a voice actor, a pharmacist podcaster, or my career transition from pharmacist to voice actor and podcast host. My interview shows feature a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something educate in some way, or entertain so that you are inspired to use your voice too. You can find my podcast at thepharmacistvoice.com. Dave, thank you for everything you do for podcasters everywhere. I love the School of Podcasting podcast, and I've been a part of the School of Podcasting for three years. I have learned so much. Highly recommend. If you're looking to start a podcast, I highly recommend the School of Podcasting. Thanks for including my response in the October 2022 question of the month and happy podcasting, everyone. It's always a good day when you wake up with a voicemail from Kim Newlove in your inbox. I love what she said. It's all about making content that makes an impact. And I actually have the same thing. I kind of agree. I started the school of podcasting thinking I was going to end up with a bunch of 30 to 35 year old entrepreneurs that were going to use it to help market their business And I have those, absolutely. I also have writers who have finally figured out that I can't read your blog in the car. Uh, I've also had, you know, YouTubers that are, have figured out that I can't watch your video in the car, but I can listen to it as well as when I'm doing the dishes and things like that. And uh, I was somewhat surprised that I ended up with a lot of baby boomers who have an empty nest, but they have years of experience and a passion and a need to help people. So, yeah, it's it's kind of fun. We have what we think we're going to talk to and then the people that show up. For me, when I talk about talking to a singular person, I'm not so much talking about the different types as I am. I just hate the hey guys thing. That's it. That's it. Bottom line, yeah, when I hear somebody start off a YouTube with hey guys, I'm like, ugh. And that's just probably just a Dave thing. Hey Dave, this is Gary from the Everything Everywhere Daily Podcast. And there are two things that I do that run counter to most of the advice which is given to podcasters. The first is that people are always told to niche down, keep niching and keep niching until it hurts. Well, my podcast is called Everything Everywhere. I I literally don't have a niche. I talk about everything and every day it's something completely different. So I went in the entirely opposite direction. The other thing that you're always told not to do is not to quit your day job. Well, I didn't technically quit my day job. My day job quit me. I had a very popular travel website and I was a travel photographer. And when the pandemic hit, I kind of lost all of that. So I threw myself into my podcast and I launched a daily scripted podcast where I write a unique 2000 word script every single day. And I have basically treated it as my full time job. And now it's actually starting to pay off. After about two years, I'm closing in on getting a million downloads a month. And by putting in the work, I've been able to see the results. So, yeah, I think those are actually good bits of advice for most people, but I sort of ignored it and it's worked out for me. 
So once again, my podcast is Everything Everywhere Daily. Here's a fun one. I have worked with with Gary on the podcast review show. He came on and Eric and I went over his show, but I have heard Gary on other shows so often and I kept thinking I need to interview that guy because I knew he was getting a million downloads a month and I've thought about it so much I thought it actually happened and it turns out it hasn't. So Gary, I'm gunning for you, buddy. Hey Dave, this is Bill Monroe with the Stroke Cast at strokecast.com where a Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and one-handed banana peeling. In response to your question of the month about what piece of podcasting wisdom do you tend to disregard, uh, I'm going to go with the need to publish every week or to publish on a set schedule. And I know you are a strong advocate of this. Uh, What I have found is that I originally started publishing every week. Eventually, life got in the way, and it became a lot more difficult to do that with committed regularity. So I ended up switching to every two weeks, and then it became two to three episodes a month on different days, just depending on when I was able to get it done. Again, with the idea that, as you've said, focus more on producing a higher quality episode than producing an on-time episode. What I found, though, is that not having that regular schedule does not appear to have impacted my download numbers. In fact, looking back over the course of the episodes I've released this year at the rate of anywhere from two to three a month, what I have seen is that since the first episode I published this year to now, roughly 18 episodes later, I have had an average of 3% growth each episode based on my 30-day download numbers. Some episodes, it's been more, some it's been less, but the average has been a 3% growth, which is great. If I can just lock in 3% growth overall uh, perpetually from one episode to the next, that would be fantastic. My overall growth from the beginning of the year, uh, first episode of the year to most recent episode to pass the uh, 30-day download mark has been 36%. So growing uh, at 36% on my 30-day downloads since the beginning of the year to now, I think that has certainly validated that my lack of a regular schedule is not a huge impediment to my growth. If I looked at overall download numbers, sure, they're lower, and I could bump those up by just pushing out more episodes. But looking at that 30-day number, I think, has certainly validated that for me and has shown that it works. And I'm guessing that's in large part because I have a lot of subscribers that are subscribed or followed. So they're not necessarily looking for an episode the moment uh, on a specific day and time. They're looking for an episode when it hits their podcast app. And that's, again, why following and subscribing is so important. And others' episodes are probably just being driven by social media and sharing by guests when those come out. Anyway, uh, that's been my experience at the StrokeCast, uh, available at StrokeCast.com. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thank you so much, Bill. And are we hearing kind of a pattern here like, hey, we're building things for not only my audience and what works for them, but what works for me? Because if doing a weekly show is going to kill you, because, you know, life then don't do a weekly show. We do what we can. We start from where we are and you just kind of go from there. And have you also noticed nobody's been punched in the face yet? No one will punch you in the face. Thank you, Ryan K. Parker of Food Craftsman. Next up, if you like the logo of the School of Podcasting or the logo of Ask the Podcast Coach or the artwork from the Podcast Rodeo Show. That's all due to a guy named Mark Decote from podcastbranding.co. Hi, Dave. It's Mark Decote here from podcastbranding.co. First off, thank you, Patrick, for this great question. And if I do say so myself, you have a great looking website over there at bigseance.com. <clears throat> I built that for him. Anyway. 
standard or traditions in podcasting that I ignore? Well, I am a solo podcaster, which many find that strange. I've done close to a thousand episodes all by myself. I don't actively try to monetize my show. What? You mean that it's okay to podcast and not try to make money from it? What, what, what? Who knew? But I think the biggest tradition that I ignore is my introduction to Resourceful Designer podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com. They say you should keep your intro short. Well, my intro is almost a minute long. Not only that, but I have a unique intro every week. And I'm not talking about just changing what the title of the episode is. For over 300 episodes, Wayne Henderson from MediaVoiceOvers.com, the guy who does Dave's, now that's a good question, Ooh, he introduces something unique about me. Things such as my fondness for peanut butter and banana sandwiches, or that I had a mullet in high school, Ooh, or that my desired superpower is telekinesis, or that I don't care for croutons in salads. When I first started Resourceful Designer, People told me that this wasn't a good idea. It's a podcast about running a graphic design business. My listeners don't care that I learned how to drive on a Chevy Monza, but I've stuck with it for over seven years now. And last year, when I wanted to spruce things up on the show and I surveyed my listeners on what changes they would like to see, all 82 responses that I receive pleaded with me not to change the intro. It's one of the parts they love the most about the show, because it shows them that I'm just a regular person like them. And FYI, if anyone listening to this thinks I stole this idea from Pat Flynn, you're not wrong, but I did ask Pat's permission before I started, and he gave me his blessing. In fact, he even warned me about how hard it gets. It's not as easy as you would imagine to think up of hundreds of unique things to share about yourself every week. Thank you so much, Mark. When in doubt, ask your audience, and that's what he did, and that's why he didn't change his intro. From one Mark to another. Hi, this is Mark Vinette from the History of North America podcast, where I explore the wonderful and tragic stories of North America's inhabitants, heroes, villains, leaders, environment, and geography at markvinette.com. The length of my episodes go against the grain. I like to keep my average show duration at 15 minutes, which is shorter than the norm. I do, however, publish three episodes per week, which helps me maintain regular contact with my audience. I always love how Mark comes in, introduces his show, drops his answer, and literally just drops the mic and walks out. <laughs> I think it's great. And yeah, I know when I started, the you know all, all the gurus said that the average commute in America was 20 minutes. And so I did a 20 minute podcast and then I went to my first event and was lucky enough to have some people who actually listened to the show. And the first thing they said was, yeah, make it longer. So it really kind of like what Mark was talking about and you hear other, other people talk about it. It really depends on the audience. You know, we are serving our audience. What kind of podcast do they want? Let's throw it over to Scott. Good morning, Dave. Scott Johnson here. I want to say if anyone wants to know what the standard recommendations are for how to do a podcast, They should listen to your other show, the Podcast Rodeo Show. There's lots of good recommendations on there, as well as a lot of examples of how not to do things. And one of the things you mention is that at the beginning of each episode, you should state pretty clearly what the show is about, mainly for first-time listeners, so they kind of know what they're in for. And I agree, that's good advice. And I did that for the first couple of years on my show. I used to say... You're listening to What Was That Like, where we talk to regular, everyday people who've gone through something extremely unusual. We get inside their head because we all want to know, what was that like? But more recently, I've kind of gotten away from that. In my show now, I start each episode with what I call a cold open. I'll just start talking about something that's related to the story in the episode they're about to hear. It's only for a few minutes, And I try to make it interesting enough that even a new listener doesn't just give up and go on to something else. I want them to be intrigued about what's coming up. And part of that is that I'll say who the guest is, first name only, and tease a little bit about what happened to that person. So hopefully that makes people curious enough to think, hmm, what's going on here? Of course, my regular listeners already know what's going on. 
but I think a lot of new listeners stick around just to see what happens. My influence for doing it this way was Phoebe Judge. She hosts the ultra-successful true crime podcast called Criminal, and she also has the best voice in podcasting, by the way. That's what she does with a cold open, and when I hear her do that, it really sounds like a show of confidence. Like, do I really have to say what this podcast is about and what it is? Everyone knows about this podcast. So the only real so-called explanation at the beginning is when she says, I'm Phoebe Judge, and this is criminal. It's a really strong way to come off the starting line, and I liked it, so that's what I do now, even though it's not the traditional way to do things. My podcast is called What Was That Like? And for each episode, I talk to some person who's gone through something extremely unusual. Recent episodes were with a lady who, at age 16, witnessed her father's murder, a man whose arm was literally torn off in a machine, and then we had a fun one with a woman who went on The Price is Right and won the showcase with all the behind-the-scenes stuff on how that works. The guest comes on the show and tells the story of what happened firsthand. It's on all podcast apps, including Spotify or at whatwasthatlike.com. Thank you, Scott. That is one of my favorite shows. It was interesting because he did one with a woman that won The Price is Right, as he mentioned. And it was interesting because I thought he broke format because usually something happens and then, oh, you're not going to believe it. Then this happened and, oh, you're not going to believe it. But this uh, and, and yeah, I thought he was breaking format and you'll have to go listen to find out if he did or not. But I've been I when I am not making new tutorials, I often go and take other people's classes just because I want to see what they're doing. I want to look at their onboarding process. And I took a course on YouTube thumbnails. And the person, I believe their channel is called Film Booth, said there are three things when you are starting a YouTube channel and realize uh, I will be one. I'm not going to die on that hill, but YouTube is not a podcast. Okay. But also we're all content creators. And they said at the beginning of an episode or a video in the case of YouTube, you need to be doing one or more of the following. And that is grabbing attention proving relevance like hey this is something you need or three which is what scott does so well which is intrigue so you need attention relevance and intrigue at the beginning of your show and so what scott has done is he's made you hear this part of a story to where you're going wait i want to hear the end of this what so yeah when you can get your people your audience going i want to hear the rest of this That's what that intro is because we had other people comment on the beginning of their shows. Hi, Dave and fellow podcasters. This is Karen Velez from the Just Grow Something podcast, where I teach gardeners to plan, plant, grow, and gather their best harvest from their gardens, no matter what size gardening space they're working with. You can find me at justgrowsomethingpodcast.com. With regards to what Patrick asked in the question of the month, What standard practices in podcasting do I ignore? That whole referring to my audience as listeners, yeah, that doesn't fly with me. I have always referred to my audience as my gardening friends, and I frequently use the royal we in my episodes to refer to my audience and myself collectively. Like Patrick, I view my audience as a community, and I hope they feel that in the way that I speak to them during my episodes. As for intros and outros, where Patrick's are highly produced, mine are getting progressively shorter. They're backed with music, and I have lots of info on my background and the reason behind the show in the intro, and lots of calls to action in the outro, and I'm seeing that now as more of a problem than an essential element. I shortened them at the beginning of my second season, and heading into my third season now, I plan to shorten them again, specifically the outro simplifying it into just one or two calls to action. My intent is to incorporate anything that I want my audience to do into the episode itself organically based on that week's content. I find it more conversational and likely more effective than rattling off a list of CTAs. And one other thing that I've seen listed as a best practice in podcasting that I've totally stopped putting effort into is creating so-called share-worthy social media assets. This, to me, takes way too much time. 
it's not that I don't enjoy using social media to talk about the podcast and share the topics that each episode is about, but what I've experienced is even if there are talking points or audiograms that I post that get shared by current listeners, it doesn't mean that the people they share it with are going to become listeners. They might follow that social media account and that's where it stops. So rather than focus my time on trying to create these attention grabbing social media posts and reels and all that, I choose to share the topics in a more organic way and rely on the information to get to the people who actually want and need it and then let that lead them back to me because it's interesting, not because it's flashy. I think creating interesting assets to post to social are great and they absolutely help keep an existing audience engaged, but fancy graphics and elaborate audiograms are not going to gain me enough new listeners to make it worth the time that it takes. I feel the effort is better spent elsewhere. That's my take on the question of the month. Thanks for all you do, Dave. Again, this is Karen with the Just Grow Something podcast and you can find me at justgrowsomethingpodcast.com. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I always hear people that go through and they'll find an interview and they spend another 30 minutes listening to the whole interview to grab six seconds that is somewhere out of the middle that doesn't make sense. And I'm always, I, I'm with you. I don't think, I'm not anti-audiogram. I'm anti not enough return on investment. So if your guests are sharing them, that's kind of the only proof I would see, like, is this bringing in new audiences? Well, first I got to get people to share it and you can share it, of course, as well. But I personally, to me, instead of spending 30 minutes to have somebody go, and then the dog went in the floor and you're like, what? Uh, why not just go, hey, on this week's show, hey, this is Dave. And on this week's show, wait till you hear what happened to Karen's dog. Okay, that's not a very good teaser, but at least, you know, the, the audience doesn't need this elaborate thing. Like, I'm not going to believe your podcast unless I actually hear the person saying it. I, I've never, I could go on for audiograms for a while, but for me, I'm not saying they don't work. I'm saying they take way too much time when the audience trusts you. Just say what's on the show in a, and again, use that attention, relevance, and intrigue to get them to go, huh? interesting, and then click. And we're not the only ones that feel this way about those intros. Hey, Dave, it's Matt Rafferty from the Author Inside You podcast. On the podcast that my wife Leah and I do, we interview authors and we never start off with a sound bite. So many podcasters I hear do that. In fact, just the other day I was listening to Tony Robbins and the podcast begins with a sound bite which is part of the interview that's coming up in the next half hour or so is completely out of context. And to me, it just makes no sense. And it's just a waste of time. It's just kind of like floating there. Now there are some people and some podcasts who do it very well. I was also listening to the AARP podcast the other day and they played a sound bite, but they also had music and some voiceover that kind of built up the story so that it kind of sucked you in. We call it a cold open in the television news business. That's what you need to do, but it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of preparation. And to me, it's just not worth the time. So when we do a podcast, Leah and I, we are talking to the guest within 30, 45 seconds of the podcast beginning. We just get right to it. To me, having a soundbite at the beginning is just a waste of time and that's why we don't do it. So if you're thinking about writing a book, check out our podcast. It's called The Author Inside You, and we interview authors about writing, publishing, and promoting their books. And you can find us at theauthorinsideyou.com. Thanks, Dave, and have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Matt. We'll be hearing more from Matt in November. Hi, Dave. I'm Paul from the Fighting Through World War II Memoirs podcast. Okay, I'm interrupting. That is just one kick-ass accent. I have to say that. My show includes interviews with war veterans, plus a good helping of unpublished war memoirs and family stories from all countries and all the forces. One of the old traditions is that regularity is a cornerstone of a successful show, but I'm a bit of a non-believer on that front. I think it depends on the nature of the show, and 
if it's called the Monday News, then it pretty obviously has to come out on a Monday. And the Daily Digest is also pretty explicit as to what customers can expect. Um, but I release roughly monthly, sometimes more frequent, sometimes less. But I've never had complaints about tardiness other than polite inquiries and concerns about my health. Um, I've got a pretty loyal audience who do seem to appreciate what I do with my show, and I've grown steadily since 2013, so I must be doing something right. There's the old saying that content is king, and I've kept to that, so if my show isn't ready, I just keep working until it is. Another recommendation that I totally ignore is my show length. It varies enormously from 20 minutes to 2 hours, so it's not a consistent length, but it's random and driven by the material, though I've learnt to split particularly long episodes into two parts or more. In fact, I once ran to seven. Um, I think when it comes to podcast player rankings, two shorter episodes downloaded X amount of times might just get me more brownie points than one really long episode with the same amount of downloads. But I know the vast majority of my listeners don't get downloaded on day one, so I know my listener isn't sitting there with their tongue hanging out, just waiting for my show to drop. An interview with a veteran might be as long as a five-hour session, and that's just to record without the editing on top. Um, one of my best but toughest memoirs came as a handwritten photocopy, which I had to research and type up before I could even start editing it to make it ready to narrate. So none of my episodes fits the mould of a standard length or regularity because my material doesn't allow it. Thinking about it, I'm pretty sure there are plenty of shows I listen to and look forward to, but I never clock watch them being released. They drop when they drop, and it's always a nice surprise when one of my favourites pops up in my feed. So I do hope my listeners feel the same about my show. Dave, thank you so much for your show. I always enjoy the variety, and I'll always look forward to it, no matter how late it might be. I've been Paul Cheel from the Fighting Through podcast. Bye-bye now. Thank you so much, Paul. And I think we've all learned, really, the whole length thing, it really does depend on your audience and what they want. And it's not really, how long should my podcast be? Of course, there's the the Valerie Geller quote that I always say, there is no such thing as too long, only too boring. But the really, the question we're asking is, how long can you hold their attention? That's really what it boils down to. And as for schedule, one example, this is the person, again, that kind of breaks the rules, is Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, which gets insane amounts of downloads. And he's had one episode this year. Yep, came out in March, March 7th. Uh, before that, June 8th of 2021. Before that, November 14th of 2020. Dan puts out an episode when it's ready they are, the as I'm looking at them, five hours and 39 minutes long. And speaking of length, let's throw this over to Todd. Hey, Dave. It's Todd with Guarding Down Cast. We're a gaming podcast centered around the game Destiny from that game developer Bungie, you know, the guys who brought you Halo. You can find out more about us at guardingdowncast.com or our Discord community at discord.gg slash guardingdowncast. Uh, I am here to answer the question of the month for October. And uh, we've been podcasting for over three years now. I've always had a hard time defining our show. I tell people that our show is a long-form radio-style program with different segments in between, but we don't do the traffic and weather every hour. <laughs> we have uh, homemade ad breaks that entertain our audience as we transition between the segments of the show as well. But here's what I've always grappled with that defies what most podcasters call the norm. Our show is about three hours long. Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. I have to edit all that, too. So I realize it's a long show. As I've tried to cut the show shorter in the past, our listeners have spoken out. They don't want it being cut shorter. And, and as more proof, I've created multiple surveys over the years. And again, most of our audience likes the length of the show. I've gotten feedback that some listen while they're at work, some while they're gaming. No, well, it is a gaming podcast, after all. So there you go. The fact that our show is three hours long every week 
kind of goes against the podcast conventions that a one hour show is considered long. But I'll be honest, it still bugs me to this day. Thanks, Dave, for all you do for us podcasters out there. Thank you, Todd. And going back to this whole length thing, of course, I'm going to quote the Valerie Geller quote, which is, there is no such thing as too long, only too boring. But I mentioned Dan Carlin. His episodes are five and a half hours long. He puts them out, you know, when they're ready. And the reason they take so long is they're five and a half hours long. But it really depends on your audience. Uh, back in the day, the early days of the school of podcasting, I had Judy from Farm and Wife, and she sent me her first episode, and it was three hours long. And I'm like, Judy, it's three hours long. And she goes, yeah, I know. My audience is saying it's too short. Because her audience was a bunch of farmers who are sitting on a tractor, which pretty much drives itself until you have to make a turn. And so they're like, hey, that was pretty cool. Got another one? So in the case of Todd, you're doing a show for gamers who might be sitting on the couch for days, depending on how many Depends or whatever they're wearing there. And they might want a three-hour podcast because they're going to start after dinner and they're going to play video games until they go to bed. And maybe they want you in the background. I don't know if that's something you can do. I haven't played a video game since Tecmo Bowl. No, I take that back. I've played a little Madden. But anyway, uh, so it really depends. And all you can do, think of your podcast. I always use the analogy of your podcast is a recipe, not a statue. And how do you know if food is good? You go, here, taste this. And you go, what? And you go, here, taste this. And you put a little spoon and stick it in their mouth. They go, mm, it needs more salt. Okay. You don't go, oh, that's it. I quit. I'm not making any more. You know, you just go, oh, okay, cool. Let me try a little salt here. So, you know, again, nobody's going to punch you in the face. What do I do that is non-traditional? And I didn't even realize until later I was like, oh, in fact, some people call it, oh, he's doing a Dave Jackson. I've heard people say that. And that is my interviews. If somebody says something really cool, I just stop and go, hey, did you did you see that? And it's the educator in me. I'm like, hey, I want to make sure you're not missing this point. So I would interrupt the interview and people are like, you can't do that. You, that's like you're interrupting your guest. And I'm like, well, I'm interrupting the guest in post. I'm not doing it live. And, and people have said, oh, that's kind of fun. It breaks up the monotony and you're kind of waiting for another time when Dave is going to pop in. So that is something I do on a regular basis. The other thing I do that I wish I didn't, but it's kind of part of my job. I have so many podcasts that I've started. And if I could go back in time, I would just do one. I would do this one, but I've started so many to play with different formats and things like that. And I've actually scaled back a few this year. I just went, no, that's too many. And I would rather make you know, one podcast that was amazing than six shows that were meh. And so I've scaled back on that. Thanks to everyone. I'm here to tell you every time I put out a question of the month, I'm always like, is anybody going to reply? There's always that chance. And so when it, not only did you guys reply there, he said, did you hear me? I just did the plural thing. I should have said, not only did you reply in my head, that's how I would coach Dave not only did you reply, but they were amazing answers. And again, I am so happy that people are willing to go to me and go, yeah, I totally disagree with what you preach. I think that's amazing. And that, that's what I want. As a teacher, you want a space where people are allowed to go, excuse me, sir, that doesn't make sense. And I can go, let's have a dialogue about that. And then we might actually learn something. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just... I'm giddy, I tell you, giddy. So thanks to everyone again, schoolofpodcasting.com slash 851. If you heard somebody show and you're like, hey, I want to check that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, 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 I'm not done yet. I'm not done. I need to make a point here. It was the whole point of the episode. And that is, this is for the person that's like, well, can I, the answer is yeah. Well, can I start a podcast that, that is just solo? Yes. Can I podcast with a co-host? Yes. Can I can I mix it up? Can I do it? Yes. Can I do a podcast that's 45 seconds? Yes. Can I do a podcast that's 16 hours long? Yes. If the answer is can I, well, let me turn to one of the greatest rappers of all time, Dr. Seuss. 
He says, uh, and I would podcast in a boat, and I would podcast with a goat, and I will podcast in the rain and in the dark and on a train and in a car and in a tree. Podcasting is so fun, you see. So you can podcast in a box, and, and you can podcast with a fox, and you can podcast in a house, and you can podcast with a mouse, and you can podcast here and there. You can podcast anywhere. You can start a podcast with a cow. Just go to schoolofpodcasting.com right now. And sure, there are best practices, but as we've heard today, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and you can come and you can ask me, and I would love to help you, but in the end, it's going to come down to your audience. But realize, in the immortal words of Zig Ziglar, Zig, suddenly Zig Ziglar sounds like Forrest Gump. That's all I have to say about that, Jen A. Uh, you don't have to be great to start, but you do have to start to be great. Next week, you will hear the one and only, don't be fooled by cheap imitations, Mark Decote. The S is silent. And we're going to talk about the power of words and how just changing the way you present something can lead to much better results. Now, if you're worried about, oh, I got to come back. No, just go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash follow and you can follow the show. And as soon as it's ready, it'll come right to your phone. That is schoolofpodcasting.com slash follow. Thanks so much for listening. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed. Yeah, if you're a new listener, I always say your podcast should do one or hopefully more than one. What was that? Hopefully? Did I just make up a word? That is something I have kind of not done regularly. Is that even a word? Is that what's up with making words? I've been a part of the School of Podcasting for three years. I have learned so much. Highly recommend. If you're looking to start a podcast, I highly recommend the School of Podcasting. Yeah. What she said.